press the bell icon on the YouTube app to never miss a video from News Laundry. Hello and welcome to NL Interviews. I am Meghnad and I have with me today a very, very fascinating personality who has recently be, been in the news as well and you might have seen a bunch of his speeches, interventions and uh, he keeps giving interviews to um, the media. Uh, I have with me uh, Mr. Harsh Mandar. Hello, sir. Hi. To the people who are watching this and do not know uh, Mr. Harsh Mandar, I'll quickly give a bio after that question. Uh, is uh, Mr. Harsh Mandar is a human rights and peace worker. He's a writer, columnist, researcher and teacher. Uh, he has formerly, formerly worked in the Indian Administrative Services and he has served in states like Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh for two decades, right, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, after the Gujarat riots in 2002, he left service and he became an activist. When civil servants see violations of civil liberty, as you saw mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, even now, if you see, um, I think uh, Arna Roy also quit because she saw some violations of civil liberty and how government is not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. And there's Kam Kanan Gopinath more recently. Uh, we have an interview with him on News Laundry as well. Um, so. In cases like these, it makes one wonder uh, whether uh, there are like these handful of bureaucrats within the government who see it and then the only thing they see towards it is it's resigning and speaking out. Or are there people within the system who are also working? How effective is that versus how effective is what you did? I, uh, you know, in the in almost 17, 18 years, uh, I worked uh, in government. I uh, I loved every every moment of my time, uh, and and I loved it because I uh, I had the space and the, res the resolve and the space to do everything that I believe mm. in, and uh, and I you know uh, I also taught for a period in in, in the Masuri Academy, uh, and um, one of my early first lectures to uh, the young uh, civil servants used to be. Uh, about the right and the duty of a civil servant to dissent. Hmm. And I exercise that right to dissent consistently uh, through all, 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 all my years in the civil service and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually survived uh, as a result. I mean, I had 22 transfers in 17 years of work, but uh, that was, a, uh, that was uh, a, a small price to pay. But otherwise, I, I, I was able and I fought many battles uh, uh, within the government. And there is, the, is a, a, the democratic space for it. The 2002 uh, violence, I think, for many of us marked a particular moment in the journey of our republic. But then one has to wonder, there are people like Ashok Khenka who have been transferred like a million times. And he still continues to work with the government and sort of... Um, you know, try to change the system from within, right? Um, how much freedom does a bureaucrat actually have to do that? I think a civil servant does have a significant amount of of of, of power, hmm. uh, but but the kinds of things that are happening now, I mean, uh, uh, so a civil servant could could not uh, change, say, uh, the idea of the citizenship amendment or. Right. Or the uh, the policy on the Ram Mandir, or on Kashmir, or you know many things that we uh, we uh, are so anguished about. Uh, but there there are moments, and there are many moments, uh, increasingly when I wish I could have uh, been within the civil service. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. For instance, as your book title says, uh, "Partition of the Heart." Uh, yeah. So can you elaborate on that a little more? In a speech that actually has been uh, has troubled the Delhi yeah. police enough for me to be charged cheated uh, yeah. in, in, in a murder uh, in that speech I said I spoke about the heart actually uh, and so let me sort of uh, bring that in uh, I said uh, there that ultimately the battle and the battle the struggle against a particular law which was in this case citizenship amendment act and the NRC and the NPR. I was saying that it is not really uh, a battle simply about, uh, uh, you know, a thousand word law. 
uh, it is something much deeper. So I said, it's not going to be decided in parliament. It's not going to be decided in, uh, in, in, in the courts. I said, it'll be decided by we, the people of India, who gave ourselves a constitution, made certain promises to ourselves. It's we, the people of India, who will ultimately have to resolve it. And right. have to resolve it on the streets through peaceful resistance and agitation. Uh, but I said that there's a fourth place where most of all this, uh, this, uh, this question is going to be resolved. And that fourth place is... What sort of support have you been seeing uh, for yourself? And do you have any uh, legal support? And uh, what sort of... Uh, sort of uh, what, what have you been hearing after this chat ch 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 was filed? Uh, I, I have been touched greatly by uh, the... the the kind and degree of support that I've got from, uh, you know, it's, it's been uh, very reassuring. Uh, uh, but I, you know, and, and a lot of people have advised that I should uh, apply for anticipatory bail uh, and, uh, and also keep, keep a low, hang, profile. Uh, low profile for this yeah. period. Uh, to my mind, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not, I don't propose to apply for anticipatory bail. Hmm. Uh, I believe that what, according to you, is the idea of India? The idea of India is is ultimately the idea that this is a country that belongs equally to people uh, of of you know, immense diversity. Uh, uh, that there are no conditionalities to belong. Uh, uh, that you have to you, you, you can worship, uh, believe, uh, eat, dress speech, languages, uh, uh, and both identities of, uh, uh, of uh, ethnicity, uh, race, color, uh, sexuality, uh, whatever, uh, and still belong equally. But my question is more related to um, how the, uh, the masses are looking at this pandemic plus the issue of poverty now. Uh, I mean, on a surface level, there is a movement towards more charity, donating more to like, say, something like a PMKS fund, but that's a separate matter. But also like organizations and people are doing fundraisers and trying to help out people uh, who are suffering. So uh, in that sense, the pandemic seems to have brought people on a common footing against the virus as a whole. But I want to know from you how deeply the odds are stacked against the poor and vulnerable citizens right now and also about how the perception of uh, people of looking at the vulnerable and the poor has changed if at all it has changed i i feel that uh, what what we uh, what what the response to the pandemic uh, the pandemic uh, uh, you know uh, the virus is uh, is of course indifferent to whether you're rich or poor, Muslim or Hindu, uh, but uh, uh, it loves crowded, unsanitary places and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but what, uh, what we have, what, 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 what our response, the official response and the middle class response uh, to the pandemic and its fear has exposed us as, as being an extraordinarily unequal and uncaring mm. uh, society. Uh, when the Prime Minister spoke to us uh, the, the day he announced the lockdown, he said, please stay within your home, work from your home, uh, keep social distance, wash your hands regularly. Did he not remember that the large majority of Indians are in conditions, some don't have homes, uh, a, a large number of them have homes where it is not possible, where 10 people are living together in a, in a shanty of uh, Six by eight or ten by ten feet, right, right. Uh, and and they don't have running water. So my point is that even you know even the design of the lockdown, even if it was best implemented, excluded from its protections by design, the large mass of the, of, of the people. So you're saying the perception has changed the other way, as in like we have become even more insensitive as a population towards uh, the poor now? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that it has exposed how un insens insensitive and uncaring we are. Right. I mean, see, uh, you know, everyone's so amazed at, at, that there were 10 million migrants uh, uh, walking the streets. How, where were they? We didn't even know. Uh, 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 how did you not know? They're there at every That's turn true. of our life. I mean, 
uh, they are the people who build our homes. They are the people who maintain and plumb and uh, you know uh, wire our homes. They are the people who clean our homes and our streets. They are the people who take care of our children, cook our food, serve our food, uh, drive our, our vehicles. They they at every stage of our lives. They make our lives possible. But we looked at them as people who existed to serve us. I get your point about how uh, there is this element of divisiveness that is being introduced by design. Um, there are like certain, you know, let's say loudmouth people who are just taking this opportunity to sort of divide people and divide hearts, as you have put it. Uh, but what is the uh, what is the solution to this? Like, how can we become more collaborative instead of divisive? Please recognize that this, I, I, I still underline that this has not happened by chance. It's not a few loudmouth yeah. people who decided to, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, air their bigotry. This was something that was centrally done through the official establishment. Through, but yeah. this wouldn't happen unless there is some inherent bigotry within yeah. sort of all of us, right? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I talked about, the, thought about this a lot and not about mm. this moment, but also the last few years. Uh, we are also a country where Mahatma Gandhi, you know, at a time when a million people had dined at him in Muslim diets, uh, in partition, where Pakistan had been constituted, rivers of blood were flowing. My own family was uprooted with all of that hatred to still say that this would be a country uh, which would belong equally to all uh, required enormous courage. Hmm. And please remember that the majority of Indians supported and loved Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so. Uh, so let me say that in my understanding, all of us are constituted by... I want to talk a little about how um, there is institutional, uh, there is a lack of institutional empathy, right? So people like you or someone within the bureaucracy, as you said, might have personal empathy towards uh, the vulnerable people. But when it comes to the government or, or the bureaucracy as a whole, where does this go? And where does this apathy come from? What is the compulsion to behave in such a monstrous way? I, I've spent a large part of my life fighting for a, a just and caring state. I reached a point in my life when I realized that a just and caring state can only exist within a just and caring society. Right. And, okay. and, and the problem is not simply out there. It is, it is here with us. Mufat khoro, muft mein itnaich milega. To watch the full unedited interview, you have to subscribe to News Laundry and pay to keep news free. Because when the public pays, the public is served. We depend on you and not on advertisers. So go to www.newslaundry.com slash subscription and subscribe and get all our unedited interviews, our special video shows, comics and everything that's behind the paywall. Remember to subscribe to News Laundry, you pay just about 10 rupees a day. That's less than... Well, no, a cigarette and smoking is injurious to health. So subscribe and watch the full interview.